Hi all, uh, happy Sunday, hope you're all staying safe. Uh, welcome back to another video from the Australian Reptile Park, Jake here. And uh, today we're talking about frogs. Now, one of the most popular things we get asked here at the park is, are frogs reptiles? Of course we're at a reptile park, we have many frogs here, but frogs are not reptiles. They are uh, a completely different group of animals. In fact, they belong to the group known as the amphibians. Now, there's a few other uh, groups of amphibians. You've got toads, you've got Sicilians, uh, salamanders. There's a few different uh, groups, but if we're talking here in Australia, the only native amphibians we have are the frogs. And we have over 200 species of frog. We're extremely fortunate. They're highly variable. They all look uh, more or less, well, a lot of them look very similar, but uh, there's a lot of variation in them, particularly in terms of size. We get some very, very large ones. For example, the giant burrowing frogs that you get here on the central coast locally, they can get up to the size of about, I don't know, like a large mango. So can a white-lipped tree frog from North Queensland. Um, whereas we also have some very, very tiny frogs and uh, we might actually start out with the tiny frogs we've got in this little uh, pet pack here. Now in here we have some corroboree frogs. Now corroboree frogs, as I mentioned, one of our tiniest frogs, but they are, are also one of our most iconic and one of the most beautiful. Now, um, unfortunately for this species, they are critically endangered. There's actually two species. They're known as the Northern and Southern Corroboree Frog. Um, we keep the Northern species here at the park. And you can see, unlike many other frogs, which uh, will hop or spend a lot of time in uh, trees and by the water, uh, these Corroboree Frogs are ground dwelling frogs. And they typically walk along as we're seeing there. They uh, belong to a genus known as the uh, Sidophrony, um, which is quite a large group. Uh, they all more or less are the same size, but again, they're highly variable. Here in the Sydney region, we have a species called the Red Crowned Toadlet. Um, they're species that range all the way up into Queensland and then even over into Western Australia as well. Um, but this one here actually has a very, very small range. I'll pick him up here so you can see the size in my hand. Um, has a very small range uh, down toward Canberra in the ACT. Um, but the more endangered of the two, the northern corroboree frog, sorry, the southern corroboree frog, um, which is Sidophrony corroboree, is only found uh, within Kosciuszko National Park. This one here is Sidophrony pengilii. <laughs> now, you might have seen when you flipped over there, they actually have a beautiful underside to them as well. They're very vibrant. Um, and the reason for that is to warn predators. Um, they are actually slightly poisonous um, and certainly not something that you want to make a meal out of if you're a, a predator, say a bird. Um, so they have those bright warning colorations. A beautiful frog, but unfortunately in a very uh, dire situation in the wild. Now, thankfully for the two corroboree frog species, there's a number of conservation programs which are working uh, very, very hard to ensure that this beautiful little frog is around for a very, very long time to come. We've got a couple in here, in this little pet pack here. Um, and then we've got a few more over in their exhibit. And their exhibit is actually quite interesting in the fact that we keep them inside a fridge. Because they come from such a cool alpine environment, we have to replicate that here at the park. We're keeping them at about 15, 16 degrees to ensure they don't get too warm and they're living in a very similar um, climate to what they would be out in the wild. Now we're gonna go from one of our smallest frog species there um, to one of our larger species. I'm just gonna quickly change gloves here. It's very important that we maintain uh, strict hygiene when we're working, particularly with amphibians, because they have what we call a permeable skin. They can absorb <coughs> substances through the skin and they're basically going to be taking in whatever is in the environment around them. So if you've got something on your hand, a chemical, um, perhaps you've put on some sunscreen, perhaps you've been uh, touching some chlorinated water, all of those things can actually be quite detrimental to the frogs. So we ensure that we wear gloves and we also ensure uh, that we're using water that is, uh, has basically has a lot of things removed from it. It's what we call reverse osmosis water. It's very pure, clean water, excellent for the frogs. Now this here, he might go for a jumpy, I don't know, uh, is known as the splendid tree frog. And uh, whilst it does look very, very similar to the uh, green tree frog, which is found uh, across much of the country, this one is actually like the corroboree frog, frog found in a fairly small region of the country over in WA. It's known as the Kimberley region. Oh, 
He's on the camera. <laughs> I'll take that back. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, they are fantastic at doing what frogs are well known for, and that's jumping around. Now, despite them having this permeable skin that needs to stay quite moist, uh, this is one of the species that can deal with slightly drier conditions. I have seen this species in the wild over in the Kimberley, and typically when you find them, they can be quite a way away from water, and they're typically hang hanging out on dry rock faces. So they can go a fairly long time without having to go uh, for a swim, certainly, and they're more so relying on the rain and staying down in deep crevices to keep cool and uh, stay moist as well. I'm gonna try and pop this one back in here. We've got another one that's bunkered down in here. As you can see, this species is more of that typical green colour that we associate with frogs. Um, but one thing that's characteristic to the splendid tree frog, and part of the reason that they get that name, splendid, is because of these beautiful uh, dots that line the back. They've got these lovely yellow dots that um, go all down, right down to the legs. And uh, yeah, they're just a stunning frog. They get very, very large, about double this size, if not triple. And yeah, they're from the Kimberley region of WA. Now I mentioned before that in this country, our native amphibians only consist of frogs. But of course, as many people are familiar with, um, we also have one highly invasive amphibian. And that's what I've got sitting in the box in front of me here. Now this is known as the marine toad or better known as the cane toad here in Australia. And it's actually a species from Central and South America. That is where you typically find uh, these toads. And toads range, range right across Central and South America, uh, also right throughout Asia. They typically get much, much larger than frogs. This species can get up to about the size of a dinner plate and they typically are not too vibrantly coloured. Uh, they're primarily uh, a shade of brown or very, very dark in colour. Now, the cane toad, as I mentioned, from Central and South America, but made its way to Australia in the mid 1930s. Back in those days, the cane farmers in North Queensland were having a lot of issues with a small insect, the cane beetle, destroying their cane crops. They wanted something to eradicate the beetle and they thought, we've got this very large toad that loves to eat a lot over in Central and South America. How about we bring a couple of those over to this country, we'll release them into the cane fields and hopefully that gets rid of the issue. Now, there was a big issue and that is the fact that cane toads, they're pretty well strictly arboreal. Unlike a lot of frogs, they're pretty pathetic when it comes to climbing and even their hop is only about five or six inches off the ground. The cane beetles they were brought in to eradicate live right at the top of the cane stalk, about three to four metres high. So the cane beetles and these cane toads, they never interacted. The cane toad never ate a single cane beetle, but what happened is that this species began to breed and they are prolific breeders. So from originally where they were introduced in Innisfail in North Queensland, they have now spread right across the northern parts of the country. They're right through the top end. And unfortunately now uh, they are venturing into the Kimberley region where these splendid tree frogs come from, which is a very uh, biodiverse, very incredible wilderness region. And uh, these cane toads are coming through. And unfortunately they cause massive destruction within the ecosystem because they are poisonous. Right behind the eyes here, um, they have large poison glands. And the poison within those glands is quite foreign to our Australian wildlife. So if you are, say, a quoll or a king brown snake or a yellow spotted monitor, you come across, you see this cane toad, you might not necessarily be able to tell the difference between this and a native frog, which you've grown up consuming. They'll try and eat the toad, they get that poison, they ingest it and then they very rapidly die. It's very, very toxic to the majority of our Australian wildlife. It's decimated um, entire species and they really cause massive destruction wherever they go. So they are undoubtedly the worst invasive species that has ever been introduced uh, to this country. And still as it stands, there's no real way of uh, eradicating cane toads. They are uh, very efficient at breeding. They're very prolific. Um, they can travel enormous distances, and as I mentioned, they've spread right across the northern parts of the country. Now, we're going to pop this one back in here. 
that one there, as I mentioned, he's about half grown, so he's gonna get um, a fair bit bigger. Uh, not quite as large as the females, which get extremely large. And a female cane toad, believe it or not, could have over 30,000 eggs in a single go. So, uh, yeah, incredibly prolific when it comes to breeding. That's a big part of the reason they've spread so quickly. All right, we might uh, get some questions now. We've had a look at these three species. Yeah, so can we start with the life cycle of the frog? Yeah. Can we bring the splendids over though so we can get some nice close up? Yep, I'm just gonna change my gloves here. We'll bring them over here so you can get a close look while I do that. So of course, as many, as many people are familiar with, uh, frogs, they start their life, or most of them do, as a tadpole. So it's a tiny little, uh, I guess, well, it's the start of a frog, um, but it doesn't have any legs. It's got a long tail, which is, it uses for moving through the water, and they are living almost exclusively in the water. Um, and then a lot of species will also uh, have their tadpoles in small puddles, and some even just uh, pop the tadpoles into a plant that gets uh, a little bit of water to it every now and again. So they don't have to be exclusively in uh, you know, a large body of water. The tadpoles can live in reasonably small bodies as well. Now, after a little while, that tadpole is gonna begin to feed, and eventually, it'll begin to uh, pop out some legs. Now, typically what it'll do is pop the back legs first, um, they're the larger of the set of legs, of course, and uh, what that means is they can move about a little bit better. They've got those back legs, then those front legs will pop out, and then what happens is that tail that they've been using to swim around will reabsorb. It disappears quite incredibly, and at the end of it, end of it, um, you basically have your frog. Um, they look almost identical to the parents, just a miniature form, and then they can begin to leave the water. They'll begin to hop around and uh, yeah, they begin to grow until eventually they get to the size where they can reproduce themselves and uh, the species continues like that. So it's quite an incredible life cycle. Um, you know, species that start their life looking very differently to the, the parents are quite rare, really. The other common example is, of course, uh, the butterfly and the caterpillar, um, but quite an incredible way of, of reproducing. But it is important to note as well, not all frogs um, go through that tadpole stage. Um, we have some frogs which we call direct developers, which will go straight from an egg uh, into a miniature form of the adult. So some skip the tadpole stage, but most uh, don't. They have to go through that period of being in the water. What's a frog's diet like? Uh, primarily, uh, at least for the Australian species, it consists of invertebrates. Um, so they'll be feeding on all manner of insects, moths, uh, crickets, locusts, um, whatever they can catch really. Some of the larger species have also been known to take things like small snakes, small lizards, um, even other frogs. So once they get very, very large, um, they have quite the appetite and whatever comes close to them and they can fit it down their mouth, they'll try and consume. There's some uh, quite phenomenal photos of particularly large green tree frogs feeding on small snakes. Um, they're certainly capable of that when they reach adult size. What's the lifespan of a frog like and does it vary between species? It, it certainly does and, and for some larger species it can be uh, quite lengthy. Um, for example, the, uh, the green tree frog um, and certainly this species as well, the, the splendid tree frog, they've been known to live in excess of 15, 20 years potentially. So it's quite a long life and uh, a fantastic thing if you're keeping them in captivity because um, they make a fantastic pet. They're beautiful to look at. Um, certainly not one that you're going to be touching and you know getting out of its enclosure all the time. Um, if you want a, a pet that you can hold all the time, perhaps uh, go to something like a, a cat or a rabbit. Um, but a frog, beautiful to look at and with the appropriate licensing, just like reptiles, which we spoke about um, not too long ago, you can keep uh, frogs as pets. Are they endangered as a species? Uh, certainly some species are incredibly endangered and that not only goes for here in Australia but right around the world. Unfortunately amphibians they're faced with um, a, a pathogen, a, a virus which we call chytrid fungus um, which affects the, the skin of the frog or the salamander, whatever amphibian it may be. 
and eventually it will kill them. Now, this pathogen is very easily spread um, via contact uh, between the frogs themselves or even between water. So for example, if someone were to walk in a waterway, um, which was infected with chytrid fungus, and then go to another waterway, they could very easily transfer uh, that virus from one system to another. It's spread right throughout the world. Um, there's many, many species that uh, are, have been decimated by it. And unfortunately here in Australia, we have lost entire species. Um, frogs have gone extinct due to the chytrid fungus. So it's a horrible thing. And unfortunately, many of our uh, amphibians right across the globe are endangered uh, primarily due to that. So if people have, um frogs in their backyard what can they do to you know help them one of the best things you can do um, if you feel like you've got a bit of a, a frog uh, population going in your backyard is actually create uh, a backyard pond um, I mentioned before that for that reproductive tadpole stage um, they like a bit of water so um, if you were to pop a pond in your backyard uh, what's gonna happen is those frogs will congregate around that pond um, they'll breed more readily, you'll have more frogs, and you're going to be really helping out the, uh, the local population. So by creating a, a pond, um, you're really going to be helping those frogs out. Can you just go through one more time for the people who joined in and only saw the end of the cane toad um, talk? How did they come to be in Australia in the first place? Yeah, so they are a highly invasive species. They have not always been here. Um, originally they're from Central and South America. And where they occur naturally, um, they've evolved with, with the native wildlife there and they don't really cause too many issues. But cane toads back in the mid 1930s were introduced uh, to Queensland to combat the, the cane beetle, which was decimating cane crops. And unfortunately, they did not eat the beetle. The, the plan was a complete failure. But what they did, they began to breed prolifically, spread right across the northern parts of the country, became a horrendous invasive species, and they have caused um, massive destruction within uh, the northern Australian ecosystems and uh, caused the loss of, of quite a number of species. Um, while we're talking about toads, we may as well have our last question now. How do you tell the difference between frogs and toads? Yeah, it, it's, it can be quite confusing sometimes and it depends on the species. Cane toads are quite an easy one to tell from a frog because um, almost always they're going to be this deep, dark, kind of brown colour. And what you're looking for is that bumpy, almost warty surface to the skin. If you look at a frog, typically they have quite nice, smooth skin. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned before, they're also um, very good climbers. Most of them, they're spending a lot of their time in low-lying brush, bushes, um, as well as on rocks and things like that. Whereas these cane toads and most toad species, um, they actually will spend almost all their time on the uh, ground. They're horrible climbers. And uh, that is, again, another one of the ways that you can tell the difference between the two. All right, guys, we might, um, we might finish up there. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about our native amphibians as well as one very destructive invasive. Uh, we love them here at the park and uh, frogs out in the wild, they need as much help as they can possibly get. Perhaps look into what species are local to your area and how you could potentially help them out. That'll be amazing. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. As always, we'll have plenty more of these videos coming to you and we will see you next time. Thank you guys, bye-bye.